But what that does illustrate is that Jonathan had absolute faith. He had trust that this is going to be what happened because God ordained it, therefore it will come to pass. Doesn't matter what my dad does. Doesn't matter what everybody else does. Doesn't matter if we're invaded by the Philistines or whatever. God said you're going to be king. You're going to be king. It's as simple as that. I wish more Christians had that kind of respect for God's word now. Hey, fellow tacticians. Be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report for today does come from the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to continue our series in that. And you may recall that our last passage that we read, Saul is pursuing after David after the incident at Keilah. So he thought he had him pinned down. David was able to escape thanks to God's help. And so now he's just kind of roaming around and Saul is pursuing after him up in the hills, up in the wilderness in Israel. And so this little meeting and this little episode that we're going to look at today takes place in 1 Samuel 23, verses 15 through 18. Now David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life while David was in the wilderness of Ziph and Horash. And Jonathan, Saul's son, set out and went to David at Horash and encouraged him in God. He said to him, Do not be afraid, because the hand of Saul my father will not find you, and you will be king over Israel, and I will be second in command to you. And Saul my father knows that as well. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord, and David stayed at Horash while Jonathan went to his house. I think the first thing that we need to dissect before really understanding what that verse means is look at what the significance of the covenant that they made really means here. Because covenant is a word that we kind of have a, a flowery idea about, and, and there's some correctness to that. I mean, it's something that's very serious. What are the covenants that are mentioned in the scripture? So we have something to compare, some kind of baseline to work off of. Well, we know that God makes covenants with people. He made a covenant with Abraham that his people would be taken care of and that he would make him a great nation. He made a covenant with Noah that he would never destroy the world again through the flood. He made a covenant with Adam that eventually uh, he and Eve, that one day Satan would bruise his, uh, one day he would uh, bruise mankind's heel and mankind would bruise his head, of course, culminating in Jesus. So God makes covenants with men on a pretty regular basis. He makes a covenant with Moses and the children of Israel to start the nation of Israel. And then, of course, we have a covenant with Christ. There is another covenant, though, that can be entered into through people. And the most common covenant, there are other covenants mentioned in the Bible like this one that are not this, but the most common one is marriage. So a covenant's not just a promise. That's part of it. But a covenant is more like a deeply held solemn vow. It's a lifelong commitment. It is something that is so much more than a promise. It's a, a dedication to something that is, is far deeper than just your regular like, okay, I promise I'll be at your speech that you're giving or something like that. I mean, th this is something that will affect a person's life. And so David and Jonathan commit themselves to supporting one another. They commit themselves to as brothers in Christ, or in this case, you know, predating Christ, of course, as two men that are trying to live the way that God wants them to live, that they will be there to support and help one another. And that they're always going to be looking out for one another. And by the way, they've done a pretty good job of this up until this point already. Jonathan's already helped save David's life on a number of occasions. And I mean, I think Jonathan knows that David would do anything for him as well. And so this covenant that they engage in, it's something that is not to be taken lightly. 
it's very strong. And another thing that we have to remember about this, that just by showing up, but much more swearing allegiance to David, this is something that Jonathan was knowingly putting himself in harm's way. His life could very easily be taken by his father if his father finds out about this. If he knows that Jonathan has not only gone out to see David without his permission, but more importantly, has committed to protecting and helping him whenever he can, that would be viewed as treason. And by the way, don't think that Saul is not above doing something to him because he's his son. Multiple times we've seen in this narrative already, Saul has sought to do harm even to Jonathan when he defied him. He was willing to even take his own son's life at one point. And so don't think for a second that Jonathan didn't know that. Don't think for a second that Jonathan didn't understand what he was doing here. But he did it anyway because he knew that David was the one that was right in God's eyes. And because of that, and because Jonathan had a desire to also be on God's side, he sided with David over his father. That was a choice that he made, and he did so knowing that it was dangerous. So, I think that the lesson to take from that is Jonathan loves God and David more than he fears Saul. And I think that that's a powerful lesson for us to take to heart as well. We should love God more than we're afraid of people. We should love Jesus more than we're afraid of losing our job losing our savings, uh, not getting, you know, whatever prestige or, or honor that we have, being an outcast from the community. If we love any of those things more than we love Jesus, that is going to lead us astray. Jonathan, even though he knows it might cost him his own life, is saying, no, I must be on God's side. I must be doing what God would want me to do. And God clearly, based on his actions, has demonstrated he wants David to be king, not Saul. So I'm going to forge a covenant with him and be on their side as opposed to my father's. Not because I don't love my father, not because I don't care about him and want what's best for him. Remember, Jonathan eventually goes on to die in battle next to his father, defending him. And so this isn't a lack of love for his father, but it is an acknowledgement that my dedication to God supersedes my dedication to my father. It is more important as a relationship and as an obligation than my obligation even to my own flesh and blood, my own father. And I think that also means that because he had such faith, because remember he says, look, you're going to be king. You're going to be king in place of my father, and I will be your second in command. And of course, that never happens because he does die in battle. But what that does illustrate is that Jonathan had absolute faith. He had trust that this is going to be what happened because God ordained it, therefore it will come to pass. doesn't matter what my dad does. doesn't matter what everybody else does. doesn't matter if we're invaded by the Philistines or whatever. God said you're going to be king. You're going to be king. It's as simple as that. I wish more Christians had that kind of respect for God's word now. They looked at the scripture and said, well, God said it. That's, that's the end of the argument. I no longer need to parse out whether or not uh, how am I going to react to this? Or No, I mean, that's what the Bible says in plain English, ergo, it's going to happen. And so that's exactly the same thing that we're dealing with right here. God said, David, you're going to be king. He anointed him by a prophet. Okay, God said it. That's what's going to happen. His faith really does, I mean, kind of leave you awestruck with the kind of confidence that he had. And it was because of that faith he was able to do that. And because of that confidence, he's able to encourage David, who had a pretty strong faith himself, but is probably dealing with a lot right now. I mean, he's, he's in the wilderness. He's an outcast from his people. He's living with a bunch of vagabonds. He's, you know, this is not a good place for him. And he's been promised by God, despite the fact that he's continued to wait and it's caused him trouble. And he's being pursued by a man who he's never done anything wrong to. He's never tried to hurt, tried to threaten, never shown any disloyalty to him whatsoever, other than just being a good soldier. That's all he's ever done his entire life. And his reward for it is being persecuted like he's some kind of criminal. And Jonathan, because of his great faith, is able to go out into the, the desert and reassure him of these things and also encourage him and say, look, I'm going to be there for you. 
God's going to be with you. He's going to get you through this. And I'm going to be there for you too. That is a great blessing to have a friend that looks at things that way and can also help you put things into perspective, especially when you're not in a great place. And it says that he encouraged him in God. So there is a, a physical encouragement and a, a sort of emotional encouragement from his friend coming to see him. But there's also a spiritual encouragement that is there that is being worked on David, I think, uh, possibly directly from God because of Jonathan's interaction. I don't know if that's the case or not. I don't want to say more than the scripture says, but it seems to imply that God is there with Jonathan, helping him in his encouragement. And I think that that is not at all unreasonable to assume that that is the case. So then we come to an interesting question. Is Jonathan disloyal? Because the Bible does say to honor your father and mother. That's part of the law of Moses, which Jonathan was under at the time. So is this in any way a violation of that? I mean, he is swearing allegiance to Saul, uh, to David, even though he's saying that David is going to overtake Saul and he will be king. And then all of a sudden, Jonathan is going to be David's second in command. Well, if that's the case, uh, isn't that kind of saying that you're against your dad? Actually, no. And here's why I say that. He was not disloyal to God. He did exactly what, what God would want him to do. Because God had already anointed David king, and so this doesn't mean that he was not supposed to honor his father. That doesn't mean he was supposed to not care about what happened to his dad. In fact, based on the end of the story, I think it shows that he very much does love his father. That he did respect him, and he was willing to even die for his father. So this is not a lack of love for his father. But it is a acknowledgement that he has a stronger obligation to God and also to Israel. He wants what's best for Israel too. And he sees David as being what is best for Israel, which is the reason that he supports him. And ultimately, the truth is, I think that he's actually being loyal to Saul too. Sometimes when we love somebody, maybe even a parent like it was in Jonathan's case, but we see that they're wrong, we see that they're doing something that is incorrect, the best thing that we can do for them is to stand against them, to say, no, that's not okay. What you're doing is not acceptable. Doesn't mean we don't still love them. Doesn't mean we don't still respect them. But because we respect them and because we love them, we love them too much to lie to them. We love them too much to roll over and just say, no, whatever you want to do is fine. No, because we want you to have a better life, to be better people, to be more in compliance with God's will. Sometimes we have to lovingly look at a brother and say, I love you, but you're wrong. And that's exactly what Jonathan was doing here. Disagreement is not the same thing as disloyalty. Jonathan and Saul disagreed vehemently on this. And Saul was wrong because he was defying God and he was trying so hard to hold on to his own power that he refused to acknowledge the fact that God had decided something else. I genuinely think that Saul could have, the, the end of this story could have been that Saul sees the error of his ways and repents and begs forgiveness and steps down from the kingship and says, this is God's anointed now, you follow him, and retired. And that could have been the end of the story, and, and he and David could have been great friends. There would have been a lot less bloodshed in Israel over the civil war that happens. And that could have been the end of the story. But it didn't because Saul cared more about himself than he did about doing what God wanted. But I think that kind of mirrors God's relationship to us, doesn't it? I mean, in a lot of ways, I think it does, because God loves us enough to seek out what is best for us, even when we're at our worst. Even when Saul is so eaten up right now with anger and paranoia, Jonathan still wants what's best for his dad. He still wants his dad to, to avert face and turn around and do the right thing and repent. But he wasn't going to allow his father's bad decisions and his father's defiance of God to drag him down with it. Essentially, this is him saying, look, at a certain point, I can go no further. At a certain point, I have to make a decision and do what God wants rather than what my father wants. And that, in the long run, will actually be what's best for dad if it plays out. And God does the same thing to us. He doesn't love punishing us. He doesn't love denying things to us because we aren't ready for them or whatever else. But sometimes God has to look at us and say, look, in, in my case, Caleb, 
I know what you want, but what you want isn't good for you. So submit your will to mine, and I will extend my hand, and then I might be able to give you what you're asking for. Or maybe it will change your heart to where you want something else. But ultimately, God cannot make us happy apart from himself because no such thing exists. And in the same way, Jonathan could not continue to allow his father to go down this road and to go like, well, that's what dad's doing and, and he's the king, so I guess I got to go along with him. Jonathan took a stand and said, I will do what God wants. And that'll be best for me, best for David, and best for my father as well. So I guess the moral of that lesson is, when it's all said and done, if we just follow what God wants us to do, then that's what's going to be the best possible result for everybody involved, not just ourselves. And we can never let somebody else's sin or somebody else's bad decisions tempt us down the road to following them rather than following what God wants for us. Stay the course, friends. To convince you to like this video and subscribe to my channel, I'm about to do some political impersonations. First up, Bernie Sanders. It is immoral that in this country, the top 1% of YouTubers get all the likes and subscriptions. John Kerry. Please remember to ring the notification bell. President Joe Biden. If you like the show, call. TV guide and tell them. You know, the thing. Kamala Harris. Batman would want you to like and subscribe. <laughs>